the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, the International Monetary Fund confirmed ongoing discussions with Sri Lanka's newly elected government as part of the nation's ongoing economic recovery efforts. Official data released by the central bank show that Sri Lanka's gross foreign exchange inflows in August 2024 have surpassed imports with inflows reaching 2411 million US dollars. The final trading day of the week saw an upturn at the Colombo Stock Exchange as both the ASPI and S&P SL20 ended with gains today. And Millennium IT ESP leading enterprise solutions provider in Sri Lanka marks a significant milestone in its growth journey with the establishment of its global service delivery center at Port City Colombo. From Studio 24, here's Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The International Monetary Fund confirmed ongoing discussions with Sri Lanka's newly elected government as part of the nation's ongoing economic recovery efforts. During a press briefing held on the 3rd of October 2024, IMF spokesperson Julie Kosak outlined the organization's latest interactions with Sri Lanka, emphasizing the need for continued reforms to maintain economic progress. In a significant meeting, President Anura Kumar Disanayake engaged directly with the IMF delegation, which included Director of the Asia-Pacific Department Krishna Srinivasan and Senior Mission Chief Dr. Peter Brewer to discuss the progress of Sri Lanka's ongoing IMF program. The President was accompanied by key Sri Lankan officials, including the Central Bank Governor Dr. Nandalal Veera Singha, Secretary to the Treasury Mr. Mahinda Sirivardhana, Dr. Harshana Surya Peruma, Senior Advisor to the President Prof. Anil Jayanta and Mr. Duminda Hulangamo. President Disanayake reaffirmed the government's broad agreement in principle with the objectives of the IMF program but emphasized the importance of achieving these objectives through alternative means that relieves the burden of the people. The president stated that the government plans to provide relief to those who are struggling due to high VAT and income taxes. Meanwhile, India's Minister of External Affairs Dr. Subramaniam Jai Shankar arrived in the country for an official visit. During the visit, the Indian External Affairs Minister paid courtesy calls on the president and the prime minister. <laughs> Official data released by the Central Bank show that Sri Lanka's gross foreign exchange inflows in August 2024 have surpassed imports with inflows reaching 2411 million US dollars compared to imports of 1654 million US dollars during the same period. Current inflows include merchandise exports of 1224 million US dollars which is the highest since August 2022 and remittances of 577.5 million US dollars and gross service of 609.3 million US dollars. Travel abroad was reported as 99.7 million US dollars for August and air transport 61.2 million dollars. Services outflows were 322 million dollars. When inflows are spent by their recipients like export factory workers, families of expatriate workers, tourism sector workers or staff of information technology firms, imports are generated. Since inflows come from areas other than merchandise exports like tourism or remittances, there's usually a trade deficit. When foreign fund projects resume, imports will be boosted. Since most people save for all foreign exchange earnings to be turned into imports, saving have to be invested via private credit which will generate more imports as building materials are brought in and workers are paid. When interest or dividends is paid or debt is repaid on foreign reserves are billed from savings domestic investments will fall and the current account deficit would narrow. The Central Bank of Sri Lanka announced the issuance of the Banking Act Directions number no. 5 of 2024 on corporate governance for licensed banks. These directions were issued with a view to strengthen the corporate governance processes and practices of the licensed commercial banks and licensed specialized banks. The new directions will come into effect from the 1st of January next year with certain extended effective dates upon which the prevailing directions on cooperative governance issued in 2007 will be revoked. The banking sector of Sri Lanka is mainly funded by deposits accounting for nearly 81.5% of the funding structure of banks as at end of last year. The board of directors and senior management, chief executive officers and key management personnel of licensed bank play a pivotal role in safeguarding the interest of depositors. The banking sector is dynamic, fast evolving and becoming increasingly complex while being exposed to the emerging risks, frauds and failures. 
Accordingly, a robust corporate governance framework that encompasses sound corporate culture and values, healthy composition of BOD, strengthened process of assessment of fitness and propriety, and strong risk management and control functions is of paramount importance for the banking sector. Accordingly, with the enactment of the Banking Act No. 24 of 2024, which came into effect on the 15th of July this year, Intalia CBSL focused on strengthening the legal and regulatory framework related to the corporate governance in the banking sector. The Export and Import Bank of Korea has agreed to financially support the Sri Lanka government's development project. The agreement was announced during a meeting between officials of the Exim Bank of Korea and Secretary to the President Nantika Sanat Kumar Naika at the Presidential Secretariat. The financial support from the Korean Exim Bank for development projects was suspended after the economic crisis and sovereign debt default. The statement said that during their meeting, representatives of the Exim Bank expressed their commitment offering subsidized interest loans for the re-implementation of these projects. They also emphasized that their intention to support economically viable programs initiated by the government of Sri Lanka in the future. Director of Exim Bank Won Suk Ha, Deputy Director Hanui Han and Project Manager Nalin Jaithunga participated the meeting. Retired Admiral Srimavan Sarachandran Singha assumed duties yesterday as a chairman of Sri Lanka Ports Authority. He was the commander of the Navy from October 2017 to December 2018. Retired Admiral Sirimevan Sarat Chandra Ranasinghe assumed duties yesterday as the Chairman of Sri Lanka Ports Authority. He was the Commander of the Navy from October 2017 to December 2018. Admiral Ranasinghe also served as the Secretary to the Ministry of Ports and Shipping and Southern Development in 2019. He is an anti-submarine warfare specialist trained at INS Vendoritti in Kochi. He followed his Defence Services Staff Course at Wellington, India War Course in NDU, Islamabad, Pakistan and National Defence Course at National Defence College in New Delhi, India. Admiral Ranasinghe was born in Anuradhapura and first joined the Sri Lanka Navy in 1982. He had his basic training at Naval and Maritime Academy Trincomalee and at the Britannia Royal Naval College, Dartmouth, England. He obtained his MSc in Defence and Strategic Studies from the University of Madras in 2000, his MSc in War Studies and Defence Management from the National Defence University, Islamabad, and MPhil in Defence and Strategic Studies from the University of Madras in 2013. Let's take a short commercial break. Market updates on the other side. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The final day of the week saw an upturn at the Colombo Stock Exchange, as both the ASPI and S&P SL20 ended with gains today. That marks an end to a mostly positive week at the Colombo Bourses. For more on today's trading sessions with us, we have with us Vinodini Rajapupti from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. After two consecutive sessions of losses, the Colombo Stock Exchange saw a solid turnaround today driven by strong participation from high net worth investors. The ASPI crossed the 12,000 mark for the first time in three months, closing at 12,053, gaining 124 points from the previous day. The S&P SL20 index also rose by 56 points, closing at 3,540 for the day. Meanwhile, the market turnover reached 2.8 billion rupees, reflecting a 57% increase over the monthly average. This surge was primarily driven by banking sector counters, including Sampat Bank, HNB, and Commercial Bank, with off board transactions in Sampat Bank accounting for 31% of the total market turnover. The banking sector dominated the turnover, contributing 64% while the capital goods and food, beverage and tobacco sectors jointly accounted for 18% of the overall turnover. The top gainers for the day were SMB Finance Voting, Citizens Development Business Finance Non-Voting, HNB Finance Voting, Samson International and Muscalia Plantations. Meanwhile, the top losers for the day were Blue Diamonds Voting and Non-Voting, SMB Finance Non-Voting, industrial asphalts and e-channeling.
And as the week comes to a close, how was the performance of the two bourses measured? For an analysis, we have with us Nitmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. The market commenced the week on a bullish note, easing on the green zone, recording at 11,855 as investors displayed a strong buying interest as most of the stocks experienced price gains. Further towards the week, the banking sector and apparel sector shares mostly contributed to the turnover whilst backing the positive momentum. Towards midweek, the ASPI stumbled as it lost momentum, landing on the red zone as selling pressure and profit taking emerged across most of the sectors. Accordingly, banking sector shares exited most of the negative pressure, namely Hat National Bank, Sampath Bank, and Commercial Bank. Towards the latter part of the week, the market regained momentum and ended on the green zone as ASPI recorded at 12,000 and 53 gaining over 100 points. Turnover was recorded at LKR 2.8 billion during the day, 57% higher than the monthly average of LKR 1.8 billion. Notably, the ASPI gained 1.7% throughout the week as turnover gained 8.5%. Banking sector and blue chip stocks mostly contributed to the positive momentum witnessed during the week whilst both high net worth investors and retail investors participated commendably. Gold prices climbed today, bolstered by safe haven demand stemming from the Middle East conflict, while attending turn to the upcoming U.S. payrolls report to access, assist the Federal Reserve's policy direction. Spot gold rose 0.3% to $2,662.72 per ounce after reaching an all-time high of $2,685.42 in September. For the week, bullion has gained 0.2%. U.S. gold futures has also edged up 0.2% to $2,662. $682.90. The dollar is 0.2% pulling back from a one-month high, making gold more affordable for holders of other currencies. Oil prices were changed a little today but remained on track for strong weekly gains as investors weigh the prospects of a wider Middle East conflict disrupting crude flows against an amply supplied global market. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures were down by 0.08% to $73.65 a barrel. Both benchmarks were headed for weekly gains of about 8%. Concerns over oil supply that drove up prices earlier in the week has also been tempered by OPEC's spare production capacity and the fact that global crude supplies have yet to be disrupted by the Middle East unrest. Libya's eastern-based government and Tripoli-based National Oil Corp announced yesterday the reopening of all oil fields and export terminals after a dispute over leadership of the central bank was resolved, ending a crisis that had heavily reduced oil production. The Sri Lankan rupee has appreciated slightly against the US dollar today in commercial banks. According to the commercial bank, the buying rate had decreased from 290 rupees and 33 cents to 288 rupees and 28 cents, while the selling rate has dropped from 300 rupees to 298 rupees. Next, let's take a look at the Sri Lankan rupee's performance against global currencies. Let's take a short commercial break now. This is the Nike Business Report. Welcome back. Millennium IT ESP, leading enterprise solutions provider in Sri Lanka, recently marked a significant milestone in its growth journey with the establishment of its global service delivery center at Port City, Colombo. This strategic move reinforces Millennium IT ESP's commitment to expanding its international presence and meeting the increasing global demand for its cutting-edge technology solutions. Shivan Gunatilaka, CEO of Millennium IT ESP, 
expressed its enthusiasm, saying the launch of the Global Service Delivery Center at Port City Colombo reflects their unwavering commitment to growth, excellence, and more efficient delivery of services. The launch of Millennium IT ESP's Global Service Delivery Center at Port City Colombo is part of a broader expansion strategy that began in 2021 when the company took its first step towards global expansion by establishing a regional office in Singapore. This initial move was aimed at tapping into new markets and capitalizing on the company's unique resources, skill sets and capabilities. Millennium IT ESP has since built upon these foundations, expanding into Bangladesh in 2023 to cater to the Sark region and subsequently into Dubai. These expansions have been driven by the company's vision to leverage existing partnerships and relationships in the ASEAN region, further strengthening its footprint in the international market. This October, Courtyard by Marriott Colombo is set to enchant your senses with a gastronomic journey to the heart in Pakistan. In collaboration with the High Commission of Pakistan in Sri Lanka and Sri Lankan Airlines, the hotel is proud to present the Pakistani Food Festival, a celebration of the country's vibrant culinary heritage, meticulously curated to offer Colombo a taste of Pakistan like never before. Over the course of 10 days, guests are invited to immerse themselves in a symphony of flavours as guest chefs Chef Subeya Yaqub and Chef Ahmed, travelling from the Islamabad Marriott Hotel, bringing life to the rich tapestry of Pakistani cuisine. From the robust comforting dishes of Lahore to the aromatic spice laden offerings of Karachi and the beloved street food classics of Rawalpindi, every bite promises to be a story of heritage and passion on the plate. Starting your evening with a smoky allure of tender kebabs, followed by a delicate aromatic biryani perfectly paired with freshly baked naan. As you savour each dish, let the live traditional performances transport you to the bustling markets and festive gatherings of Pakistan. Whether you are a seasoned food enthusiast or simply looking to explore new flavours, this festival is more than just a meal. It's an invitation to indulge in the art of Pakistani cuisine. From today till 13th at the Berry Kitchen and Terrace at Courtyard by Marriott Colombo from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. People's Bank announced that it has become the first domestic systematically important bank and state-owned bank in Sri Lanka to achieve the prestigious ISO IEC certification for its information security management system. This significant milestone highlights a People's Bank's commitment to maintaining the high standards of data protection, security and trust for its customers, stakeholders and the entire banking industry. ISO IEC represents the latest international standard for information security management. By achieving this certification, People's Bank has proven its capability to implement robust security controls that protect its valuable information assets from evolving cyber threats. The certification process entailed a comprehensive assessment of the bank's security controls, technology infrastructure, policies and procedures, underscoring the institution's strong commitment to information security. The Chief Information Officer of People's Bank, Damika Daza, asserted they are deeply honoured to be the first domestic systematically important bank in Sri Lanka to achieve this globally recognised certification. This certification solidifies People's Bank's ongoing efforts to prioritise information security as a core element of its operations. The institution has implemented a multi-layered security strategy to counteract potential cyber threats while maintaining the resilience of its systems. HNB PLC has partnered with Lanka Hospitals to open a state-of-the-art wellness centre at its headquarters, marking a significant milestone in employee wellbeing initiatives within the banking sector. HNB PLC has partnered with Lanka Hospitals to open a state-of-the-art wellness centre at its headquarters, marking a significant milestone in employee well-being initiatives within the banking sector. The wellness centre, located on the 11th floor of HNB Towers, was inaugurated on the 9th of September in the presence of HNB Acting CEO Damit Palavatta, HNB COO Sanjay Vijaymana, Lanka Hospitals Group CEO Deepthi Lukwarachi, among many others. 
The wellness centre is designed to reduce the time and effort employees spend on health care needs, promote preventative care and address health issues promptly. This forward-looking approach aims to foster a healthier, more engaged and productive workforce. This initiative is the latest in a comprehensive list of programmes that HNB carries out to support employee wellness. As one of employee well-being's, as one of employee well-being's biggest advocates, HNB's programmes offer a bevy of health-related benefits, covering aspects from surgical hospitalisation expenditure, critical insurance covers and doorstep medical checkups. The Ceylon Institute of Builders has unveiled plans for the Construction Expo 2025, scheduled to take place from the 14th of March to the 16th of March 2025 at the Sidimao Bandaranaika Memorial Exhibition Centre. Dr. Rohan Karunaratna, President of CIOB, emphasised that achieving a 9.6% contribution to Sri Lanka's GDP from the construction sector requires at least 1 trillion rupees in industry work. Dr. Karnaratna highlighted the challenges faced by the industry, including significant price hikes that have impacted costs. The CIOB has developed a comprehensive costing document for various building types, which has been submitted to the Sri Lankan government and stakeholders. The CIOB is committed to promoting modern building practices and professional standards through various annual programs, including the World Construction Symposium with the University of Moratua, CIOB Exhibition, Annual Award Ceremony for Sustainable Constructions and more. The upcoming Construction Expo 2025 will serve as a pivotal platform for showcasing the latest advancements in technology and development within the building and construction sector. The event will bring together industry experts, stakeholders and decision makers, offering opportunities for networking, discovering new products and exploring business prospects. Trade visitors from Sri Lanka and neighbouring countries are expected to attend, presenting their innovative products and seeking the latest industry advancements. Going in for a short commercial break, now we'll be right back with Global Updates. This is the Nike Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Asian stocks rose today while oil prices were headed for their sharpest weekly gain in more than a year, as escalating tensions in the Middle East kept markets on edge. Investor focus was also on the key U.S. non-farm payrolls report due later in the day, which would provide further clues on the Federal Reserve's rate outlook. MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan rose 0.16% and was set to end the week with 0.5% increase. It was held by a 2.2% jump in Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index on continuing optimism over China's massive stimulus measures. The Hang Seng Index is heading for a weekly gain of more than 9%. S&P 500 futures rose 0.04%, while Nasdaq futures tacked on 0.1%, as Exco 50 futures also added 0.1%. U.S. stocks finished lower as investors kept a watchful eye on the growing conflict in the Middle East. The Volatility Index, or the VIX Wall Street's fear gauge, rose to its highest closing level in about a month. U.S. stocks finished lower on Thursday as investors kept a watchful eye on the growing conflict in the Middle East. The Dow dropped more than four-tenths of a percent, the S&P 500 shed almost two-tenths, and the Nasdaq ended about flat. The Volatility Index, or VIX, Wall Street's fear gauge, rose to its highest closing level in about a month. Investors now await Friday's jobs report for September as they look for further clues about the size of the Federal Reserve's next rate cut. Stocks on the move included Constellation Brands, which fell 4.7 percent after the beer maker maintained its sales and profit forecast for fiscal year 2025. Levi Strauss shares fell more than 7.5 percent after a tepid forecast for holiday quarter revenue underscored the denim maker's struggles with sluggish demand from retailers. And shares of Tesla fell, extending losses from Wednesday, when it reported that the number of third quarter vehicle deliveries fell short of Wall Street's expectations. 
Toyota is delaying plans to make electric vehicles in the US until the first half of 2026 due to slowing sales. But the firm will instead ship the premium cars from Japan, according to a Nikkei report. Toyota is putting back plans to make electric vehicles in the US. That's according to reports by Japan's Nikkei newspaper. It says output now won't start there until the first half of 2026, instead of late next year. The company spokesman later said that early 2026 was now likely. The Japanese auto giant plans to make electric SUVs at a plant in Kentucky. It has invested some $1.3 billion in the facility to prepare for production. It's all part of moves to introduce five to seven battery electric models in the country over the next two years. Sources have previously said that supply disruptions and corporate governance issues were likely to delay the start of production. EV sales have seen a slowdown worldwide, partly due to diverging policies on support for purchases of the zero-emission vehicles. The Nikkei says Toyota has also abandoned plans to make Lexus-branded EVs in North America by 2030. It says the firm will instead ship the premium cars from Japan. And that's all from us here at the Nightly Business Report. Join us again next week for more key updates across the business globe. Until then, I'm Sandy Mudal Naika. Thank you for watching. Good night.